Hi everyone and welcome to week 10. This week we are going to be talking about some uses and abuses of data and databases and we're going to be talking a little bit about UI UX. So we had mentioned UI UX I believe last week as a slight introductory but basically the idea is UI or user interface and UX user experience. Both of these are important when we are dealing with data and data analysis. We want to be able to share any results that we have with others and the way that we share the results and how people feel about the way that we share the results is going to be really important. So UI is how people are going to interact with our data. So that's the process of using, let's say, software. UX is how people feel about the interaction. So if you think about it, I, I do have a meme here. So UI is a cute little mug that has little ears on it. And then UX is the mug stabbing you in the eyes because something wasn't taken into account. So while it is adorable, um, it's perhaps not the most helpful thing in the world since most people probably don't enjoy being stabbed in the eye while drinking tea. Um, but if we think about it, like, for example, any software that we have, you know, all of you should be using Blackboard. Well, if you think about how you interact with Blackboard versus how you feel about the interactions with Blackboard, that's kind of the difference here. Now, when we have our data, we want to be able to share this with others and we want people to hopefully enjoy that we are sharing it with them. And so to be able to do that, we have to pay attention to UI UX and we have to pay attention to other types of data visualizations. When we have user interactions with data, it can end up leading to greater understandings of the data and greater understanding of the results. So if we are, for example, sharing data with somebody and we are presenting it in a way that's hard for them to understand or they really hate interacting with it, that can end up actually being a really big problem because if somebody hates interacting with a program or data, they're going to be a lot less likely to do it. And that means they're not going to be sort of paying attention to and working with the data and absorbing the data as well as they could be. So when we talk about UI UX, we have to think about what makes good UI or UX. So one of the first things you need to do is understand your target market. You have to meet them where you are, where they are. It's important because we don't want to make assumptions. We need to understand where they are and where they're coming from so that whatever we're presenting makes sense. So for example, one of the things that hopefully you've noticed as you've been going through this class is where I'm starting and what my assumptions are. So in this case, the students are the target market of who I'm trying to interact with. And I have to figure out where you all are at so that when I'm creating materials, writing labs, stuff like that, I'm meeting you there. I don't have, you know, sort of crazy expectations. Whereas if I, for example, said, you know, oh, well, I really want everybody to learn about data. So here's a 20 hour video on how to use SQL in day one, you know, maybe that user interaction isn't a bad thing, but um, I don't think anybody would really enjoy that, especially if you're coming into a data class where you're not sort of expected to know a lot about data. That's not the best welcome. So it's important to think about when you're sharing your data, when you're sharing your information, when you're sharing your analysis and results from your data, who are you sharing it with? And think about the journey that they're going to go through. So I kind of like to think of it like a treasure map with landmarks. So if you think about, for example, a website, websites that you enjoy using and websites that you don't enjoy using. If you think about how you go through the website, the path that your eyes take, where you end up needing to click, how many times you end up needing to click. Is it easy to find things? Um, all of that may 
makes a really big difference. You know, like hopefully you've all checked out the website that I've put together for my courses. And hopefully you've noticed that it's um, relatively straightforward to go and find all of the pieces that you need. It's not, you know, sort of hidden. Whereas with some websites, you know, you actually end up having to use a search to be able to find what you need. I'm not naming names or pointing figures like where I work or anything, but you know, we could use different examples of bad websites for how hard it could be to find something. Now, other things that we want to look at for good UI UX, um, responsive design. So one of the things that really makes good UI UX at this point is it has to be something that works on multiple devices. And so this has to be true for the data that we're sharing as well. You know, if we're going to be sharing our data, sharing our information with others, we have to think about the screen they're going to be looking at it on. So, you know, do they have a 24 inch monitor that they're staring at? Is it a 13 inch laptop? Are you bringing it to a meeting and it's going to be shown on a power PowerPoint or slide deck? Are you going to a conference at some point and it's going to be on your mobile phone so that you can pull it up really quick? Like all of those make a difference in how we want to present our data and how we want to interact with our data. Another thing that makes good UI UX is accessibility. The design should take accessibility into account from the beginning. Accessibility is making sure that the things that we are creating and presenting work for a multitude of people. It's important that we have simplicity and ease of use, and it's important that we have things like intuitive navigation, but we also need to make sure that our data is available to everybody. You know, if you end up creating data and having, let's say, a website, and that entire website is based off of color coding, and you've decided to use colors that people who are colorblind can't see, you're taking an entire segment of the population and making it so they can't interact with any of your data. Um, you know, just like if you have things that are only in written form or only in, you know, sound form or something like that, then you end up really sort of taking away the ability for multiple people to interact with your data. But this has to be taken into account as we're creating things because being able to have this sort of all baked in so it comes together seamlessly is beneficial for everybody. You know, having the captions on a video is useful for people that can't hear the voices, but it's also useful for people who could maybe barely hear the voices or who are missing things or maybe they have trouble paying attention long enough. So having the captions there gives them something else to be able to pay attention to. Like these are all good reasons to have captions on videos and, you know, sort of knowing that and paying attention to that means that you can share your information, data, or results with more people. Now, some examples of good UI and UX. Um, I do have this example here of the Bear app. I had picked it because um, it had actually won an award, and um, I thought that maybe other people might not have seen it, so I thought it would be something interesting for everybody to look at. But some other examples of what's considered um, an intuitive interface include Netflix, Spotify, Bumble, and the Google Store. Um, and if you think about how you might interact with any of these programs, um, a lot of people have probably interacted with at least one of these programs. And how you are able to interact with the program and then feel about the interaction, most people um, is relatively positive. Now, there are actually awards for good UI UX, and they'll have experts looking at this. Um, so there is, for example, the Webby Awards. Those are for websites. Um, there are also more general UX awards with the UX Design Awards. And then there's also some more examples of designs that are considered uh, really good at Dribble. So you can go look at these and see some other examples of what good UI and UX can look like. Now, on the same sort of note, what makes bad UI UX? Um, so 
don't pay attention to your target market is generally going to lead to bad UI UX because if you're always presenting every single thing in the same way and not taking into account who you're talking to, what they know, how they interact with things, then you're not going to be able to sort of reach as many people and it's not going to have the sort of same benefit. So the example that I'm thinking of here is like a pie chart. Pie chart, cool. Only using pie charts, not so cool. Um, so you just want to think about the best way to be able to present things. Um, having no plan also can make bad UI UX where you just sort of, you know, toss things in. Oh, I'll add this in because it's pretty, but it has no function. Or, um, you know, oh, well, I don't need to go try this because I know where everything is. Um, lots of clicks, things like that can make it really difficult. Um, confusing diagrams or not paying attention to how it looks for others can also make bad UI UX. So one of the easiest things to do is just get some opinions from lots of people. Um, and so if you have lots of people looking at something and saying, oh yes, I can follow that, I understand what's going on, then it's probably going to go a lot better. Whereas if it's just, you know, you, it's, really easy to sort of forget where other people are coming from. So, you know, if you're analyzing some data, then you've spent a lot of time with the data. I mean, think about how much time you spent earlier with collecting data and entering the data in or moving it to a database or cleaning the data, putting it in a spreadsheet, like all of those things, you're interacting with your data a lot more. And so that means you sort of have some ideas of how the data is put together. Whereas somebody who's never seen it before and they're coming in, they might not have the same frame of reference that you do. So when you look at it, you're going to sort of know some things about it that somebody else may not necessarily know. And that gap in understanding can lead to problems. It's actually one of the things that makes it really difficult for people who are experts in the field, any field, to explain things to beginners that maybe don't know what it is. Like if you have somebody who's a brilliant data analyst and, you know, they've come up with this absolutely amazing algorithm, like that's awesome. But if you ask them to try to explain it to somebody who's like never done data analysis and doesn't understand programming and kind of is just learning what data is, like that gap is going to be such that it's going to be a really difficult process for everybody. So it's important to sort of think about how things will look to others and take other people into account. So I have some examples of bad UI UX. Um, I'm sure everybody can think of bad options. Like I'm sure as you've been going through, um, you know, whatever your life happens to be, uh, you've had to use a product or navigate a website or play a game. And it was such a bad experience that you just kind of threw your hands up and said no. Um, you know, one of the things that like, okay, so I'm a gamer. So one of the things that will sometimes happen to me is I'll rage quit again. Now, this can be all rage quit a game because somebody decided to, you know, be a jerk and snipe. But like, as I'm going through the sort of tutorial and introduction to the world, if, you know, the controllers are really difficult and the camera's moving all over the place and the weapons are really hard to switch out and, you know, it's just like really a frustrating experience. It makes you not want to play the game. So that would be an example of bad UI UX. Um, Reddit, if you happen to like Reddit, there's an entire subreddit of bad UI battles that you can go check out. Um, some designers, I've linked one here, but there's others, have put together collections of bad UI um, if you wanted to go see some other examples. And then um, I'll give you this challenge. Try to go fill out this form as fast as you can. Um, and you can see an example of on purpose bad UI. UI UX can affect how your data is used and seen. If your data isn't organized, it's hard to use. So 
you know, the example I use here is um, birthday in a website because everybody has to enter in birthdays to websites if you're going to be logging into stuff. You know, social media has to make sure that you are a certain age. Um, a lot of places will do verifications. Um, everybody should be paying attention to things like your credit reports. You have to enter in your birthday to your credit reports. Um, I guess as a side note, PSA, if you don't already know this, you can get a free credit report from each of the agencies once per year um, and it's worth the time to go in and every like you know once a year make sure that you check your credit reports so that everything is the way that it should be and if you don't need to use your credit seriously consider freezing it okay so if you are entering in your birthday in a website you expect the dates to be in order you know um, you expect January to be followed by February to be followed by March to be followed by April you expect you know one two three four five well if those were all mixed up and they weren't organized sort of the way that you're expecting it would be really confusing and so if you needed to go find your birthday in April and it turns out that the way they decided to do it was you know November October August June, you know, and sort of out of order like that, it would be really hard for you to find what you need. Data is kind of the same thing. If it isn't sort of organized and categorized in some way, it can be really hard to find what you're looking for. Um, another example is if you give too much data or too much information, it's really easy to overload people. So if you're not careful, when you are sharing your data or your data analysis, you can give people sort of extraneous information and then they will quite frankly tune you out. Trust me, I, I, I teach people to me out on a frequent basis. Um, but like, if you think about it, you know, the amount of information that you're getting, every single person has a limit. Now, people have different limits. Some people may have, you know, smaller limits or larger limits, but every single human has a limit in how much data and information they can understand in one sitting. And if you aren't careful how much data and information you're sharing with somebody, you're, it's kind of pointless. So um, if you are thinking about, you know, sort of how you are having people interact with your data, how long it takes, think about sort of the attention span. What attention span do you have? How can you make that longer? How can you make that shorter? Um, you can also think about the interface. If your interface is confusing and frustrating, people aren't going to get as much out of it because they're going to be sort of starting to set up those mental blocks of, okay, well, this is really frustrating. What's even going on? I don't understand what's happening. Um, and then they're going to start not trusting you as much because if they have to, you know, go through like an entire complex dashboard to be able to figure out that, you know, according to your analysis, profits are up 2%, like they're probably going to get really frustrated by it and they aren't going to listen, read, see, understand what you want them to as much. You know, if you're excited about your profits being up 2%, then, you know, sharing that is awesome but if it takes you know 50 clicks to get there and a two minute video and uh, I am not a robot captcha you know and five other things people aren't going to do that like they are going to get frustrated they're going to you know basically just piece out of the whole thing and all of the brilliant analysis that you did to be able to figure out that there was the you know two percent raise in profits um nobody's going to see it. And, you know, kind of as we've discussed before, no matter how brilliant your data analysis is, if nobody sees it, it doesn't matter. So you want to make sure that you can also share what you know with others. People can also manipulate data. So when we're talking about people interacting with data, people interacting with the analysis of data, people interacting with you know, any product or software or anything. People can manipulate data. Data can really show anything you want. Um, you know, I do have a joke here from the doctor and Clara, you know, is for followers a lot? And then the doctor says, depends on the context. In Instagram, not at all. In a dark alley, yes, that's a lot. Um, because data can show anything you want, you know. So I use the example here of uh, football, American football. The U.S. is the best at football. 100% of Super Bowls are won by U.S. teams. 
are are you impressed right now? Or are you thinking like, wow, the U.S. must be the best at football? Um, if you're not, why not? Because technically that data is correct. 100% of Super Bowls are won by U.S. teams. Like, I don't know much about sports ball, but I do kind of know that. Um, and if you spent that entire thing cursing me saying that American football is not real football, I'm sorry, I'll try not to bring up sports ball too much. Um, so showing the right data or the wrong data or the right data in weird and manipulative ways will also change how people view things. If you can understand the data that's being collected and how that can influence choices, that can end up actually giving a surprising amount of power. So dark patterns is something that we see a lot where, especially in social media, the data that's been gathered and the way the data has been used um, will actually end up pressing people in different ways. And then this can lead to things like, you know, for example, doom scrolling. Um, Data and being able to press people into things can be used for good or it can be used for evil. Dark patterns would be the, you know, evil portion. But um, it is completely possible to, you know, push people in different ways using the data that we've gathered, the analysis that we've gathered. So some examples of people manipulating data. Data profiling. Um, you know, not not to go political. There's votes that are happening. There are frequent votes. P.S. Vote. It's important, especially in local elections. Make sure you have your voice heard. Um, but the data that's collected about you can basically make an idea of who you are and create this profile on who you are. They don't need your name. They don't need your address. But they have enough data that they have a very good picture of who you are. And then that can decide which ads that you should be getting. Um, you know, should you be getting votes that encourage you not to vote because you're on the other side? Um, should you be getting lies or exaggerations about whoever the other side is to try to push you one way or the other? Um, you know, all of those things can happen based off of the data that's collected and how that data is used to manipulate people. Um, another thing is interacting with posts. So part of social media is trying to get you to interact with things. Well, one of the things that, you know, they were looking at is what makes you want to interact with a posting. So do you interact with posts because you like them, really like them, hate them, really hate them? Like what makes you want to interact, whether that's a, a like or a thumbs up or a little heart or a comment, you know, what will actually make you want to do that? Dark patterns are we've collected data, we know what some of your behaviors are, we can figure out what some of your triggers are, and then we can push you into things that you may not realize are happening. So like accidentally buying something online because it was, you know, too easy to buy or, you know, signing up for something reoccurring because you didn't realize making it hard to get rid of that thing. Tricky wording and hiding information is really common. So um, the unsubscribe button on emails is a common example of this. So, you know, some spam will use the unsubscribe button as a way to figure out, is this a legitimate address? Is somebody actually checking this address? Because if somebody tried to unsubscribe, somebody's checking the address. Um, you'll also see it where some places will have hard to find unsubscribes, you know, where they will gray out the word unsubscribe or they will make only one of them clickable and it's, you know, a weird random one or they'll make you jump through hoops to unsubscribe or, you know, well, it'll take at least two weeks to unsubscribe from this list. Like that kind of nonsense. Um, you know, another example is uh, using these dark patterns to figure out people's behaviors and then using it to manipulate them into buying things. So like the HP ink cartridge. So people were buying HP printers. They were paying for what they thought was to own the printer. However, if you no longer had the subscription, the printer would stop working. Um, so, you know, that sort of manipulation and tricky things happening 
that people don't realize. Um, another example of this is apps that trick you into uploading your address book. You know, a lot of apps will say, you know, do you want to import your addresses so you can figure out if your friends are here? Um, yeah, they kind of ish don't care. They just want to have more people they can market to. And if they can, you know, as a bonus, have you find your friends so that you can interact with them through the app, like that's just happy for them. Um, some more examples of this are in deceptive design if you are interested and would like to see some more examples. Uh, there are some industries where data abuse is very rampant. Uh, you know, social media is an example of this. Um, healthcare that isn't healthcare, so like DNA databases, there has been some real controversy about that one recently. Um, banks that aren't banks. So banks should be insured up to $100,000 per account. However, some places will make it look like they are a bank that they aren't or look like a credit card, but they're not or user to user payment systems. Um, you know, I'm not particularly calling anybody out like Gazelle and Cash App here, but um, there are some that make it seem like things are happening in ways that aren't necessarily what you think. Um, large conglomerates are also really sort of well known for this and different types of manipulations. Um, I do have to also call out for-profit educational institutions. I'm not necessarily saying they're all evil, but like enough of them are evil that I would be very cautious of any of them because they are collecting all of this data about, you know, students, what makes students sign up for classes, what's the, you know, sort of current trends, how can we advertise to people, how much sort of pushing and hard sell is really worth it, and um, data abuse is really rampant because, you know, sort of the logic is if you fall for one for-profit institution, you're probably going to fall for other things because you may not necessarily know how bad that is. Um, and then I will end on examples of where data is used for common good. So um, hygiene, hand washing is actually a relatively new concept. Um, there was as late as the 1800s, I think it was in the 1840s, there was a doctor that ended up getting into basically a lot of trouble for advocating hand washing in hospitals. Now you might be sitting there thinking, um, ew, which you would be right to because ew, but it was not a common practice for doctors to wash their hands between patients. So they would just go around between all of their patients covered in blood and bodily fluids and not wash their hands. And the people that did wash their hands with like, you know, the special bicarbonate soda like hand washes were seen as weird and sometimes ostracized. Um, you know, and it took a while and a lot of data before people kind of went like, oh, hand washing, right. And that's actually still kind of an argument today. People don't necessarily understand the, you know, good of hand washing. Um, I do not identify as male, so I do not go into men's restrooms. However, I have heard that that would be an example. Um, another example would be health of a nation for cigarettes. So as you know, like less than a hundred years ago, cigarettes were seen as healthy. Doctors recommended them, like literal legit, like board certified doctors were like, oh yeah, cigarettes, that's so good for everybody. It'll cure your asthma. Um, but you know, now people are like, yeah, that's not, that's not what's going on. And it was data that allowed us to be able to figure that out data that was, you know, what was behind the studies, and then data was used to try to prevent people from starting to smoke. Um, you know, another example of this is climate change and what's going on with uh, the climate, global warming, and how that is, you know, sort of changing what's happening in the world today with, you know, everything from weather systems to the behavior of animals. So those are some examples of where data, data collection, sharing data, interacting with data, data analysis, all of those things are coming together and hopefully making a difference for the common good. So um, I hope that this made sense and was interesting and I hope you are all having a lovely day.